you know when God gives you a promise you got a responsibility of preparing for it I believe the holy bible is the perfect word of God I am what it says I am God can change you from within the identity you have in Christ gets released When Christ comes in you, the genetics of the blood of Jesus begins to function. This is where the power of God takes over. I will never again be the same in Jesus name. Amen. When you put God on the throne, even you don't know what is going to happen because he is the decision maker. Let God decide. Let God decide. We might get our job, we might lose our job. We might have this marriage, we might lose the marriage. We might get the success, we might get failure. That is up to him. But we know he is worthy of praise. Look at your enemy today and say you are not on the throne, my God is on the throne. You may be the position above me, but God is the authority above me. You may be able to decide about my job, but my career is in his holy hands. My max card may come from your university, but my future comes from his holy hands. He is on the throne. He is on the throne in the mighty name of Jesus. No cancer, no sickness is on the throne. Jesus is on the throne. Your financial problem is not on the throne. Jesus is on the throne. Let the devil know those days are over. My master is on the throne and he will choose what the future will be and what he chooses is more than enough. Praise the Lord. I want to welcome all of you that have come here this morning to worship the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. What a joy it is to come together to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is stronger, he is greater. And what joy it is to be by the side of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to welcome all of you that has come online to worship. You know what great presence of God you are going to experience today as you Worship the Lord from wherever you're watching, from wherever you're worshiping God with us. Amen. Our God is greater. He's stronger. He's the healer. Amen. I believe that His presence is going to minister to you. Amen. We're going to read from the Bible. Let's read from Psalm 71, verse 19. Clear. Your righteousness, God, reaches to the heavens. You have done great things. Who is like you, God? 
though you have made me see troubles many and bitter you will restore my life again from the depths of the earth you will again bring me up you will increase my honor and comfort me once more i will praise you with the harp for your faithfulness my god i will sing praise to you with the lyre holy one of israel my lips will shout for joy when i sing praise to you i whom you have delivered my tongue will tell of your righteous acts all day long for those who wanted to harm me have been put to shame and confusion hallelujah our god he is greater he's a god that restores us he's a god that brings hope amen come on give him praise hallelujah we worship you jesus let's look unto the lord and pray father we want to thank you for this blessed day we thank you lord god for we are standing here because of who you are in our lives and we worship you we give you glory we give you honor we thank you lord for all your goodness for all your faithfulness lord god in our lives and father this morning as we've gathered here to declare your greatness I pray that heavens will be opened up, O oh Lord God, in this place. I pray, O oh Father God, that your divine presence, your divine glory will be seen at work in this place, O oh Father. And Father, we thank you for the healings. We thank you for the miracles. We thank you for your blessing. We thank you for your favor. We thank you for your presence that sanctifies us. We thank you, Lord for answering our prayers thank you for the word that will transform lives in jesus name we pray and everyone say amen come on let's worship him hallelujah because the master himself is here to deliver us oh we worship you Yes, he is. Yeah. God is able. He will never fail. He is almighty God. Greater than all we see. Greater than all we ask. He has done great things. Lifted up, he defeated the grave, raised to life. Our God is able in his name. We overcome for the Lord. Our God is able. Yes, you are. God is with us, God is on our side, He will make a way, far above all we know, far above all we hope, He has done great things, lift it up, He defeated the grave.
Come on church, we serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is worthy of our worship. Amen. Put your hands together. Worship God in this place. He is deserving of every piece of worship that we have within us. Put your hands together everyone in this place. Come on. We have come here to worship God.
when God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. Though there, you know, storm come against us, though we walk through fire, though there is trouble all around, we know that our God is with us. Amen. He will, he's a God that restores us. He's a God that builds us through seasons of life. He gives us His grace. He gives us His new anointing. His presence leads us every day that we will be successful, that we will be victorious in what He has called us to do. Amen. Let's worship Him.
structures, let the ruins come to life. Just lift those hands and tell them, Lord, I will worship you even when it hurts. I will worship you even when it is costly. I will worship you 
I will bring to you a sacrifice of praise even when it hurts because you are able because you are faithful because you are the great I am and I will offer you my sacrifices of praise I will sing to you a new song a song of worship a song of praise to my King for all your goodness for all your faithfulness I will praise you Jesus we love you What a good God you are. I will sing of your mercies. Thank you, Jesus. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father in heaven, lead us now.
come and have your way You're a good father, we worship you We worship you God, who you are And you've been so, so good to me You've been so, so good to me And oh, to think where I would be If not for you, if not for you We sing it, you've been is the kingdom yours is the power and glory and Lord that's our prayer that your will be done on earth as the tea is in heaven bless this morning speak to our hearts in Jesus name we pray amen, amen. church shall we put our hands together welcome my dear <coughs> amen shall we do the confessions together I believe in the Almighty God, our Father and Creator. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, God and my Savior. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin. He suffered, died and rose again. He ascended into heaven. He shall soon come again. I believe in God, the Holy Spirit. I believe in holy fellowship, faithful giving. I believe the Holy Bible. It's the perfect word of God. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. Today as I learn the word of God. Here in my spiritual family. I'm blessed, healed and anointed. For a holy and victorious living. I will never again be the same. In Jesus name. Amen. The Lord bless us. Please be seated. We're going to continue to study from God's holy word on revival, that God wants us to live in perpetual revival, in constant revival, and that God wants to renew us regularly, constantly, and he wants to build our lives 
as he promised in his holy word. Amen. That God is a good God. And we must learn to live in a revival. At home when children are excited and parents are tired, there is a mismatch and parents tell children, keep quiet now. God will never say that to his children because God never gets tired. He wants his children to be constantly on a revival and his children sometimes get tired. But God sends Sundays every week to revive his children back into walking with him in the joy and excitement of serving God Almighty. And that's why the devil wants to stop you from going to church on a Sunday. All right. So in the revival series, we studied on prayer. We studied on praising God. And today we want to study on the fact that God has saved us to serve him. We are saved to serve. You know, this popular question, are you saved? Have you heard that? Are you saved? What, what's the meaning of that question? That, that's a traditional Christian question. It comes from the idea that, have you received Christ as your Lord and Savior? When you die, are you sure you're not going to hell, but you're going to be with God in heaven? So the question, are you saved, actually means, are you saved from eternal hell? Are you saved from the plan of the enemy? And how can you be saved? Through Christ Jesus. But a lot of people, they put a period, a full stop in front of, are you saved? Yes, I am saved, period. No, you are saved to serve. There's something beyond being saved. It is that God has called you and me to be people who serve a greater cause than just ourselves. Now, if you look at, if you look at uh, certain people who are in a certain image or uniform, you can, you can be sure that they perform in a certain way. For example, you know, they have certain skill sets, attitudes, habits, as they get into a certain uniform because of their image. That's why you will never find a police officer smoking or drinking alcohol in uniform. You won't. You won't hear a captain of a plane, a pilot, speaking irrelevant <laughs> to the passengers. You will never hear engineer or doctor being careless while on duty because they honor the image. They honor the responsibility. They, they may sometimes violate their integrity because of ego issues or bad moods, but they make all efforts to honor the image they have. How many of you, don't raise your hands, but you happen to take a selfie with friends or you happen to be in a group where somebody was taking a photograph or a selfie and then they showed you that photograph. Who is the first person you looked for? Can I guess? Yourself. Because we are all concerned about how we look in that. We are all concerned about our own image. And, and if we take a group photo and we want to publish it in the college magazine, we want to put it in the school mag, a lot of people are concerned about, no, no, that photo can't go. Why? I didn't look great in that. I want a photo where I look. Everyone is concerned about their image. And that's why some people, while they are in the hospitality industry as a reception or as a manager of the front office in a hotel, are so kind to people and to their customers but when they come home, somehow they are not so kind and they seem to be more rude. Why? Simply because when they change the uniform, they feel their image has changed and they behave in a certain irresponsible way. Image is very important to everybody. Now the Bible talks about our image too. In fact, the first thing the Bible talks about us when God created us is about our image because God knew how important it was. Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female, both he created in his holy image. Now the Bible is telling us when God was creating us, 
He was looking at how he wanted to create us. Now, some people think that God created some people, you know, from the head and some others from the shoulders and therefore some others from some other parts and therefore there is inequity, inequality. Some are more important than the others. That's not true. According to the Bible, some others think that, you know, we are all evolved from monkeys and that we were tadpoles, became frogs, became monkeys monkeys lost a tail and so we are licensed to behave like a monkey well the fact is that's all not true it might be true for some people I remember this famous joke about one couple who were fighting with each other and almost stopped talking to each other their daughter was confused because in the school the teacher taught that we come from monkeys and in the church the Sunday school kids church teacher taught that we come from God because God created us. You see, if your children are not going to a kids church in the church, it's most likely they might behave like monkeys because that's the only thing they will hear. But this child heard in the church that God created us and that we are responsible on how we behave. So the child comes and asks mom, mom, did God create us or did we come from monkeys? Because school teacher says this, kids church, they say this, kids church says God created us, school teacher says we may have come from monkeys we're not too sure we're still looking at theories the mother said of course God created us look at how beautiful you are you don't look like a monkey on a tree that's not your image you don't look like any other animal you don't look like a river or a mountain you don't look like a star or the sun that is round some become round but God didn't create us like that and so so it's definitely God creating us in his image. We haven't evolved into some other shape. The daughter was quite convinced and this small little girl goes to the father who was busy working on his car and cleaning it up. And to the busy father, the daughter says, Dad, our kids church teacher and mom both say that God created me. But my school teacher says that I come from monkey, probably. So what do you think? Dad says, of course, your school teacher is right. Your mom is always wrong. <laughs> the, the child goes back to the mother and says, Mom, this is a 50-50. There's a tie. Somebody needs to break the tie. 50% of the people in my life believe I probably evolved from a monkey. Another 50% believe that God created me. So, Mom, can you break the tie and just tell me the truth? Where did I come from? And Mom said, you know, both the sides are right. I told you where I come from and dad told you where he comes from. I don't know where you want to come from, but some of us, we know where we come from, that we are masterpieces of God's creation. <laughs> Hallelujah. That God created us and therefore we got to learn to love our image and respect the image God has put on us because we are not just bundles of energy. We are not just some kind of combination of chemicals. We are eternal spirits that God called us. In the Bible, as I kept checking, the word repeatedly used is God created us in his image. If you don't understand your image, you will not know how to serve that's why they give you uniforms in every office as you go higher there is a some kind of sometimes a written code of uniform sometimes an unwritten code of uniform but there is an image that people prefer to have just so everyone knows what they are offering to serve that's why a security guard has a certain way of dressing a police officer has another way of dressing and within the ranks of the police officers they have different levels of dressing just to dignify the kind of office they represent within their own department. Your image is very important. A chef in a hotel doesn't dress the same way as the waiters would dress up. And it's not in the same way a front office staff will dress up, but it's not in the same way that the cleaner boys and the janitors dress up. 
people have different images in the same institution. In a hospital, a doctor usually dresses up differently from the uniform of a nurse, which is slightly different from the uniform of a ward boy, which is very different from what they give the patients to wear as a dress. Why? Because image has an impact on how you serve. And we must not forget our image. God created us in his image. And the more we understand that, the more our serving in life becomes effective and better. Did you all understand what I said till now? Of course you do because you are intelligent. And the Bible says we are created in God's image. And I took that word image, which is spelled as I-M-A-G-E. Do I sound like a politician? But I, that's not my intention. <clears throat> I want to take that acronym of the word image and break it up into five things that we should understand about our image. In my studying, I took I, the first alphabet of the word image, as a uh, acronym for identity. Our identity is very important for a genuine revival. What's your identity? Oh, I look like a pear. I look like an hourglass. I look like a box ready to get into another. No, you have probably a physical figure, but your identity is much greater than that. You and I are spiritual heavenly beings having a physical experience on the earth but sin brought death to the body and to the spirit death of the body they call it clinical death when your heart stops beating your brain stops working and your systems collapse the doctor writes this is no longer a living being this is a dead body for whatever reason but the death of the spirit is different from the death of the body the death of the body is a clinical death but the death of the spirit is separation from its relationship with God when you're separated from God that is the death of the spirit. And when you come into union with your creator, your spirit becomes alive. The death of the body is different from the death of the spirit. Why? Because the body is made from earthly material, but your spirit comes from the breath of the almighty. And the Bible tells us, you know, Moses went through shifting of identities. A classic story in the Bible. Moses grew up as the son of Pharaoh. He was a crown prince in Egypt. Yeah, this boy had everything he wanted in life. He grew up, though he was a Hebrew boy, he grew up as Pharaoh's son. It's an interesting dichotomy, a paradox, a contradiction. Egyptians were killing the Israelites, but here was an Israelite growing up in the highest office of Egypt. And the Bible says at the age of about 40, there was this conflict in him about his Egyptian identity and his Hebrew identity. Sometimes we go through that, don't we? We have the spiritual identity and then we have our college identity. We have the spiritual identity and then we have the colleague's identity. And by Saturday evening, the colleague's identity is pulling us into the party and the spirit identity is saying, no, 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 prepare for the Sunday worship. Sometimes this happens happens not only in the life of Moses, but in the life of every believer, whether we act like it's happening or we act like it's not happening. The fact is it is happening. And some of you are not in church today because your Saturday identity took over your Sunday identity. Repent in Jesus name and get back. God is speaking to you. Now the Bible says, at the age of about 40, his rule of the flesh took over and destroyed one man and killed him and committed murder and finished funeral and had to run away from the palace because he killed another Egyptian. And he ran away for the next 40 years. The guy is feeding sheep. He's a shepherd boy from the identity of a prince crown prince of Egypt. He's a shepherd boy of his father-in-law Jethro on the mountains of Midian. It's a crazy shift of identity. Some people go mad. They can't handle a divorce. They can't handle a miscarriage. They can't handle a job loss. They can't handle something else, an accident, a crisis. 
And here is Moses going through his biggest breakdown in life. He's a shepherd for the next 40 years. And at the burning bush, God speaks to him and says, drop the memories of the identity of a prince. Give up the identity of a shepherd. Now you pick up a new identity with a rod that is anointed in your hand. You are a prophet of God Almighty. You and I can change. Our identities can change. Your greater identity of God's call on you can be superimposed on the memories of a variety of identities. Maybe you feel like a failure. Maybe you feel like a sinner. Maybe you feel ashamed of yourself. You can pick up God's call on you and superimpose that image of God's call on you on every other image and the identity God gives you can shine stronger and brighter and make every other thought pattern captive in the hands of God Almighty where you walk in victory. Go ahead, give God a mighty hand clap. I read this. I read this in the newspaper. This was about a young poor little girl who grew up as a farmer's daughter, not having three meals every day. She was a poor child. Everybody in the village knew that family because they were a part of a larger joint family, but they were very poor people. She went to the government panchayat school and she studied hard, but she didn't have enough textbooks. She didn't have enough homework books to do, complete her homework or projects but she scraped through government colleges and institutions with much you know, help from neighboring people and members of the joint family who sponsored parts of her life. For example, some people gave her extra shoes that they had so she could wear shoes to college. Some gave them dresses that were worn out from other members of the family that were used and thrown, but she kind of grew up with all of that. She sat under the street lamp whenever there was electricity city in her village and she would study there because they couldn't afford extra lights in her house to study and the story goes on as I read in the newspaper she cracked the she you know broke through the UPSC exams and became a civil servant and after her training was posted to the same village through a series of miracles as the you know district collector of that village and when she came back to her home in uniform all of a sudden the superintendent of police was saluting her the tahsildar was saluting her all the mechanisms of the government were saluting her and the farmer's family began to weep with joy because this poor little girl who 15 years ago was struggling 10 years ago was struggling three years ago they couldn't send her to the college with a fresh pair of clothes had to go in some old clothes of some family member who had donated poor clothes now this child had come back and every power and authority was saluting her. Why? Because the image changed. Something had happened about her identity through the official process. Her identity had changed. You may have come in as a sinner. You may have come in as a slave of the enemy. You probably walked in with certain elements of your life that are shameful. But with one touch of the grace of God, with one touch of the blood of Jesus, oh, you walk out a different person you walk out in the power oh, somebody give God a mighty hand that's called the power of the grace of God Almighty hallelujah many people they don't realize that you become righteous by your faith in Christ Jesus when you put your faith in Jesus you become righteous God calls you righteous but but many people think maintaining that righteousness is all about avoiding wrong things. Now that is such a lopsided view. It is such an incorrect and incomplete view of righteousness. Righteousness is not just avoiding the wrong things. It is doing the right things. Righteousness is performance of the right things. Churches should be more concerned about what are the things I should do than being worried about what are the things I shouldn't do. Because if you engage more and more your time, talents and treasures in doing the right things, chances are you will have less time to be tempted and distracted and don't have to worry too much about not doing the wrong things. 
instead of making a list of what not to do so I can stay holy, make list of what to do so I can become more righteous in Christ Jesus. It's a paradigm shift the Bible is talking about, about works of righteousness. The first word I, alphabet I, is about <coughs> our identity which requires cleansing and correction again and again. The second alphabet is the word M or the alphabet M in the word image. We are created in the image of God. And it's really about what model you want to choose. You see, when God created you and me, he put us in a garden, not in a city. He put us in a garden. He put us in a garden. In the book of Revelation, you know finally where we are? No. You read your Bible, please. <laughs> the Bible says, and I saw a city coming down from heaven. And God was putting us in this city because I think even God is fed up saying these fellows just love city. Let them be in a city. God started the Bible with a garden, but in the book of Revelation, God ends it with a city. And my strong feeling is that our attitudes are responsible for it. But anyway, God put us in a garden when he created us. And then gave us work. Many people, when they think of garden, they think of fruits and plants and, you know, just leisure, hanging around, doing nothing. That is so wrong. In God's idea, garden was like an industry. God told Adam and Eve, work the garden, maintain it. Anybody who's got a garden knows it's a full-time job. If you want a productive garden, man, it is a full-time job. And the Garden of Eden... I don't know how many thousands of square kilometers it was. It's not like the BBMP small garden. You throw one stone from here, it reaches across the garden. No, God's garden was huge. It was bigger than the country of India. Huge. And God told Adam and Madam, take care of it. <laughs> God gave two things for you and me. One is work and the other is relationships. Do not model a life where you avoid both. Don't avoid work responsibilities and don't avoid relationships. You got it, brother or sister. Don't avoid both. But they are not the garden. You just work along with them in the garden. Serving God means serving people God has put in your life. You can't serve God unless you're willing to serve the people God put in your life. The Lord Jesus Christ's greatest sermon was not Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Mahatma Gandhiji felt that Jesus, you know, preaching on the mountain called the Beatitudes of Christ, Mahatma Gandhiji always said he wanted to live by Matthew chapter 5, verse chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. But Jesus' greatest preaching was not that. Jesus' greatest preaching was when he didn't speak at all. He took a basin of water and a towel and bent down on his knees and began to wash the feet of his disciples and said one word, he who wants to be a master, learn to serve. That's the model. Now the problem... The problem with many of us is we go washing everybody's feet and get kicked in our teeth. Jesus washed only disciples' feet. He didn't put a, you know, feet washing camp in the east of Jerusalem and wash everyone's feet. No. When you follow Christ, follow Christ. <coughs> Am I helping anybody? Sometimes I sound very non-traditional, confrontational and uh, very different because I preach only Bible. I know it's very politically correct to say wash everyone's feet. That's politically correct. Scripturally correct is Jesus washed disciples' feet. Disciples were the worst lot. In fact, once you wash their feet, you don't have to wash anyone else's feet. <laughs> because one fellow among them was just going to betray him. One fellow whose feet he was washing was just going to betray him. Another fellow was going to deny him. Another fellow constantly doubted him. Now these are the top three. <laughs> <coughs> but 
We serve God. When you study the book of Acts, we serve God even through fasting and prayer. Fasting and prayer is not only to get what you want, is to get yourself to God for he wants you. Fasting and prayer, the Bible says in Acts chapter 6, apostles said to the people, we don't want to invest our time in social activities, but we want to serve God through fasting and prayer and the study of God's word. Fasting and prayer is one way of serving God. But, but we are all created differently. You know, we must feel the burden of God. We must feel what God feels about. Spending time in fellowship with God. That's an important model to follow for genuine revival. But we are all different. Some people are extroverts. Who are extroverts? They gain energy from interactions with people. Some others are introverts. They feel tired with interactions. <laughs> Some others are very expressive. They enjoy sharing thoughts and opinions with others. Uh, what they think just comes out immediately. Some others are very controlled. They think within their imaginations and enjoy it there. And it never comes out. Some others love discipline, routine. They just love a discipline of activities, expectations, deadlines. They, they just love rhetoric. Some others, they love variety. They love changes, surprises. Uncertainties make them so fulfilled. That's the model they like. Some are very cooperative. They just love working with everyone else. They like to see others' perspectives. They like to grow together. Some are very competitive. They love challenges and overcoming others and obstacles and they want to be right in the front of everyone else and some are a mix of all these things a little bit of everything it doesn't matter what your model is use your model to follow christ <laughs> the third in the word image is a third alphabet a and a stands for attitudes you are Identity conscious, your model is important, and then your attitudes. Now, this is very important for genuine revival. I, I believe God wants all of us to have the attitude of excellence. Let's say that together. Attitude of And the biggest problem against excellence is the attitude of average or competing. You know, look at others, but only for inspiration and learning. Don't look at others to compete with them. Because when you have an attitude of integrity, you're actually practicing your inner belief. You're reducing the gap between what you know about yourself and the way you're behaving it. You're reducing that gap. That's integrity. And the attitude of excellence and integrity is doing your best service no matter what you do. You're reducing the gap between what you have done and how better you could have done it. You're reducing the gap between the two. That's really a sense of excellence. And when you talk about attitude, every child of God should have a spirit of excellence. You all say, Amen, I'm going to wait till that. This is so important. If somebody beside you didn't say amen, just lay hands on them and pray for them in tongues for some time. And if that person is you, put your hand on yourself and pray for some time. Let's all say together, spirit of excellence. Everybody should have a spirit of excellence. Hallelujah. The best of what you can do in whatever you do. Come on, church. Give God a big hand, man. Absolutely. We are created in the image of God. Hallelujah. And competing can sometimes become a challenge to the spirit of excellence. The second attitude we should have is the spirit of serving. Attitude of serving. Attitude of serving. People who serve a cause, a campaign, a purpose, they are respected than everybody else. So instead of looking at the less of what you have, use what you have. Stop comparing, oh, she got that, I don't have. He got that, I don't have. Enough. Look at what you have and use it. Can you picture a David in the valley of Elah 
when he heard the Goliath roar. Can, can you see him walking around with the tissue, slightly depressed, wiping his tears, just looking at the stones? That's all. Huh? My brothers got bow and arrow. Other fellow got sword. Look at Saul. He got the whole thing around him, decked up for war. I have nothing. But this only I pluck mangoes. <laughs> and that was only in the summer. He never compared what he had with what others had. So important. This is so important. Oh, my guitar is local made. That guitar is from America. If that guitar I have, oh, I would play. David's spirit is not that. <laughs> if I also had a car, pa, I have only bike now. So what? So what? Don't compare. Learn to use what you have. Pick up what you have and serve. Come on, church. I'm preaching good today. You and I want to live a revival. Use what you have. Use, let's say that together. Use what you have. Use what you have. Say it again. Use. Sounds like a song, doesn't it? Life will become melodious when you start using what you have. I have nothing, Pastor. I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. Give me a few minutes. Some people feel inferior to others, sometimes superior to others. And that really, really, really hurts you from serving. So just stop worrying about others around you and serve with what you have. The third is gratitude. The spirit of gratitude. Have a spirit of gratitude. That is a heart of thankfulness. Instead of looking at all the negatives, find some reason to be thankful. Hallelujah. Last week when I read the newspaper about how, you know, Thousands of people's lives are so badly affected because of the flood and that the government is more concerned about passing some bills which have nothing to do with making Bangalore better. I was thinking of that song. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turn. It was not Christians who wrote this. It was a man who was not a Christian in India, born and brought up in a different religion, but he met Christ. And when they told him, we're going to kill you, he wrote this song. No bill can stop people coming to Jesus. Mm. The cross before me. Come on, sing it. The world behind me. The cross before me. The world behind me the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back, no turning back, no turning back. No turn back. Though none go with me, though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. No turning back, no turning back. No turning back. <laughs> you can't stop 
a move of the Holy Spirit. And, and this is why some of these leaders, they lack respect because they say you can't do that here and do the exact opposite when they go abroad to Christian countries. They want to go there and preach and convert people there. I just said that. Instead of being mindful of negatives, look for God's way and God's plan. Hallelujah. Look for how the Holy Spirit is going to work in the given situation. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, this bill stands above every other bill. We are assured and know that God being a partner in their labor, all things work together and are fitting into a plan for good to those, for good to and for those who love God and are called according to his design and according to his holy purpose. The word of God stands above every law. Every bill can be challenged in the courts. The word of God cannot be challenged. It is written and therefore it shall be. Be thankful because God has a greater plan in your life. Hallelujah. Yes, you might go through times of trouble. You might go through weaknesses, but God has a greater plan. The next alphabet in the word image is the word is the alphabet G and G stands for gifts, natural and spiritual. Spiritual gifts are so important for genuine revival. Holy Spirit is the one who decides what gifts we should have. And it's our responsibility to develop those gifts. And using those gifts honors God and enlarges you, expands your personality. But if you just hold it back and don't serve others, well, it's going to be more like not so happy life. Unwrap the gifts God has given you. The Bible lists a few spiritual gifts. Administration, discernment, encouragement, evangelism, faith. Giving is a gift that the Holy Spirit gives. Healing, hospitality, leadership, mercy, showing mercy, doing miracles, the heart of a shepherd, of a pastor, praying in the spirit, preaching, prophesying, assisting others, teaching, counseling. These are all gifts of the Holy Spirit. Some people think gifts means only standing behind pulpit and preaching. Not at all. Gifts of the Holy Spirit are a variety. If you think hammer is the only tool you have, then nail is the only thing you can see. Don't limit spiritual gifts to just one. There's so much of what God can do. Then you have natural abilities. Some have the ability to entertain, whether it's to perform, to act, to speak or sing. Now, I didn't have the natural ability to speak. Now, I know most of you won't believe it. It's okay. It's okay. But the fact is I couldn't speak. Most of the beatings I got is because I didn't talk properly. Today, I get invited to speak. Because where I lacked a natural talent, a spiritual gift came in. Amen. You know, the Bible says, hey, you all clap, I get late. The Bible says, where I am weak, his grace perfects his strength. <laughs> spiritual gifts are powerful. Some people have a natural gift of researching. This is not about finding mistakes with others. This is about genuine researching to read, to gather information, to collect and collate data. Some others are artistic. It's a natural talent. They have the ability to create, to design. Torn jeans is not a part of it. <laughs> and just to be clear, artistic means making better. Some have the ability to evaluate, to analyze data and draw appropriate conclusions. Some others are fantastic with planning. It's a natural ability. They can strategize, design, organize programs, events. Some others are fantastic in management. It's a natural ability. They can motivate people to accomplish a task or an event and coordinate the deal. Some are fantastic with athletics. Oh boy. They can coach, participate and, and be excellent in a variety of usage of their human body. Some others, their ta natural talent is writing. They just write. Apostle Paul was a boring preacher, but he was a master writer. And God used him to write. When he preached, people slept. Anybody wants to be like Paul? Don't. Except in writing. 
When Peter could preach and miracles happened, Paul could write and miracles happened. God uses natural talent. Some have the talent of technology in medical sciences and engineering. But the point is this, you have a world around you, whether it's the church or the world. Look at Matthew chapter 11 and the Lord Jesus is saying, whereunto shall I liken this generation? It's like a children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows. And say, we have piped unto you and you have not danced. We have moaned unto you and you have not lamented. What is God saying? God is saying this generation has become so I, me, myself with their iPhones that they don't or Samsung phones or LG phones or whatever phones. But they are so engrossed with themselves <laughs> that they can't hear the needs of the society. They they can't just understand what's happening around them. They can't see the need of their participation in the church. They can't understand their requirement in the community. They become so insensitive. And God says it's so sad. And I want to close with the last alphabet of the word image. It's the alphabet E and it's experiences. It is so important to evaluate experiences to build your image in the right direction to be more Christ-like, validate your experiences. <clears throat> you know, one easy way of preaching on a Sunday is go to internet, pick up a topic and just make a message. The simple reason I don't do it is because that is not prophetic. To be prophetic, you need to wait before God with the word of God and God puts things in you and then you put it in a format and you know, put it because there are some very, very high fashionable Christians who don't like normal preaching, you know. I mean, they don't care about how they talk, but they're concerned about how pastor talks. So just to satisfy them, you give it a professional touch. But what I was preaching till now is to you only. Change your image. <laughs> Avoid experiences of sin, of illegality, and of shameful pleasures. Avoid those experiences. Everybody has got a variety of experiences. I'll touch four and I'll close. One, spiritual experiences. Think about the time when you actually experienced your time with God. Maybe at the time you were baptized or you led someone to Christ and the joy you felt. Or a member of your, when you became the member of a prayer group, when you started participating in weekly prayer meetings in the church prayer group. Or, or you decided to start the discipline of regular prayer and how it added to your spiritual life. Or when you studied God's word or you started giving back to God, spiritual experiences or you served in some humble, simple way. Spiritual experiences can form your image in the positive direction. But that's not the only experience we have. We have painful experiences and it hurts. There are thorns and trials that we have to go through and we learn through that, don't we? Maybe abuse, maybe went through adoption and the challenges of addiction or sicknesses. Or maybe poverty, maybe somebody died in an untimely manner in your life. Maybe you went through depression or maybe divorce. Maybe you're going through prolonged legal court cases or struggles and relationships. But painful experiences are a guaranteed factor for every human being. It's about how do you handle those experiences of pain. Don't let it destroy the image of God in your life. Everybody's got work experiences, so I'm not going to deal with that. But even your childhood experiences, who were your teachers and what relationships did you have there? The other day I was speaking to a young lady who was suicidal and I said, at least think of some good times in your college, man. Why are you always thinking bad? And she said, yeah, should I think of the professor who tried to rape me and ended up just molesting me? Some people, they have memories of tragedy, trauma, but don't let it define you. Don't let it control you because there is a greater spiritual experience with which you can define the image that you were created in, the image of God Almighty. How do you handle different levels of success and failures in your childhood? And what do you allow yourself to be taught? Your identity, M stands for your model, 
A stands for your attitudes. G stands for the gifts, whether it's spiritual or natural. And E stands for your experiences. The image that God has put on your life. Don't you allow these things to baffle that, to destroy the image of God. But make sure you turn all these things until Christ be formed in you. Let's close. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at proper time we will reap a harvest if we don't. Don't stop serving. Don't ask what's the point in living a righteous life. Why do I have to be always right? I'm going through so many challenges. Maybe a job loss. Maybe financial struggles. I want you to start saying no. My image is not going to be spoiled by those experiences. It's tough. But I'll go through in Jesus' name. I'll come out successful in Jesus' name. My God will give me victory. And I'll move through by the grace of God. My image is what God put on me, not what circumstances put on me. Close your eyes and say, Father, I learned to thank you. I've learned to come with an attitude of gratitude. I've come to learn with the attitude of excellence. And I understand forgiveness is one of those attitudes of excellence. I want to thank you for the attitude of serving with whatever I have. Not comparing what less, what little, but like David, allowing the little to become useful. Hallelujah. I want to thank you, Father. I want to thank you for your able. Wherever you're seated, commit your life to God today. And say, Father, I will learn from your word. And I want to grow in that image that you have created me. I don't believe I'm lower than anybody else. And if I have any extra blessing, I understand it's to use in serving people in my life. People that you have put in my life. Give me wisdom, Lord. Give me wisdom to stand strong where I have to. And to bend down and wash feet where I have to. Give me that sense of discernment. Let me not be led by my religion, but let me be led by the relationship with you as written in your holy word. Let the holy Bible guide my life. Thank you for this church, Lord. Everybody, take a few minutes to say, Father, thank you for the church. Thank you for giving me this community to grow with, to live with. I understand every human community has its human imperfections. But thank you for giving me a garden, a spiritual garden to grow. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Come on, open your mouth, talk to the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for my spiritual home, for my natural home. Thank you, Lord, for the gifts you have put in my life, whether it's natural or the spiritual. I want to thank you. Thank you for your divine grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible says, to him who knows to do good and doesn't do, it becomes sinful. Say, God, give me the courage to serve you better. Maybe I'll start with small, but I will. I will serve in some or the other way. I'll do a six month plan, one year plan, so that by the end of the year, I'll be better in my serving. I'll find somewhere where I can serve, O oh God, in a way where my faith can be expressed, where my beliefs can come through. Hallelujah. 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 Heavenly Father, this morning, we want to thank you for speaking to us. We love you with all our hearts. Thank you for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. We bless your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and the people said, Amen. How many know God spoke to you today? Hallelujah. Let's sing together before we pray and close. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousands to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He's the lily of the valley.
valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of He, all my grief has taken and all my sorrows born. In temptations, he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken and all my idols scorn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me and Satan tempt me so, to Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright. Oh yes, he's the fairest of the thousands to my soul. Amen. Which scale was that? Shall we try? One note higher, is it? I felt you all want to sing louder and is that right? Yeah, see I can feel it. I have found a friend in Jesus. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. It's better? Okay, let's do it. Come on. The lily of the valley. Oh yes. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort. In trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to rule. He's the lily of the valley. The bright and Amen. star. He's Hallelujah. the fairest of the thousands to my soul. He all my grief is taken and all my sorrows born. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken and all my idols gone. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me and say and tempt me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousands to my soul. He'll never, never leave me. While I live by faith and do His blessed will, a wall of fire about me, I nothing now to fear. From His mana He my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see His blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley. He's the fairest. Let's sing together in sorrow. Let's clap our hands as we do it. In sorrow he's my comfort. In trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley. The bright and morning star. He's the fairest of the thousands to my soul. Go ahead church. It's our time to clap our hands. Open our mouth. Go ahead and shout out his praises. Uraba makadara la raba shikara masia le fete rebe korobo shaka. In the mighty name of Jesus, let people's life be readjusted to the image of God Almighty. In Jesus' mighty name, let there be a healing on their identity. Let there be a, a awakening on the modeling of their life. In Jesus' mighty name, let their attitudes be corrected by the grace of God. In Jesus' mighty name, let there be a flowing of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Let there be a healing on the experiences of life. Come on, somebody, lift up your voice. Hallelujah. 
Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, this day that you've spoken to our hearts, you've spoken to our image. And Father God, we want to thank you that your word will transform our image. Father God, we pray, Father God, that this week will be a change in our lives, O oh God. And each one of us, as your word has come into our hearts, we will see supernatural miracles in our life, Lord. Thank you, Father God, for your word. Father, we pray for the newcomers today. Bless them. We thank you, Lord, for your transformation power to change their lives. We pray, God, whatever questions that they've been having today, we thank you that your word has spoken to them. Bless each one of them, Lord. Father, we pray for those who are celebrating their birthdays and their marriage anniversaries this week. We pray for your blessing on them and let this year be a year of change, O oh God, a year of greater supernatural things happening in each one of their lives. Let the families enjoy peace, happiness, prosperity in their lives, O oh God. Father, we pray for those who are traveling this week. May your journey mercies go with them. Give them success in everything that they're going to do ahead, O oh God, and bring them back safely with great testimonies, O oh God, Father. Thank you, Lord. Father, we pray for your children that have given with a heart of gratitude attitude, their offerings, their tithes, O oh God. As they give today, we pray that you'll bless them, honor them, and we pray that you'll prosper, O oh God, the work of their hands, that Lord, that they will be blessed even more. And those who are going through financial crisis, we pray that you will touch their hearts, that this month be a month of deliverance over their finances, Lord. Thank you once again, Lord, today for speaking to our hearts. Thank you for this blessed service. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray, and the church said, now may the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the sweet abiding fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon each one of us from now and forevermore. Amen. 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 God bless you. First, we'd like to welcome all the newcomers today. Let's put our hands together. Welcome the newcomers. There's a guest lounge on the right-hand side. You can go in there and give in your name details and connect with them, and we will keep in touch with you. God bless you. Have a blessed week ahead. Bye-bye.